The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marcia Alvar. Victor Biasenor was born to be a storyteller, but the journey to fulfilling his destiny has not been easy. The author of Macho, the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez, and a nonfiction work about the murder trial of Juan Corona, Biasenor didn't read a book until he was 20. His first volume of family history, Reign of Gold, has been called A Latino Roots, but Villasenor nearly went bankrupt in a battle to get the book published on his own terms. Now he has written Wild Steps of Heaven, the second in a planned trilogy of works about his family's journey from Mexico to the United States. Welcome to Upon Reflection. Thank you. Glad to be here. Looking at the body of work that you've created, which is large, and includes many different genres from screenplays, dozens of short stories, uh, novels, and nonfiction. It is hard to believe that you didn't read until you were 20. What took you so long? You know, in a way, I think it was an asset not to read till I was 20, because I remember that I wrote my first book called Witness. In fact, it was Witness El Burro, Witness the, the Jackass. And it was a story about my childhood and growing up. And my cousin, who was very educated, was reading it, and he came out of the room sweating, just sweating, and, and he went out for a walk, and he came back, and, and he said, I should be the writer. I'm educated. I've read books. And then he says, how did you be the writer? How did you become the writer? He said, I get it. I know why you're the writer, because he said, you never read. You're ignorant. You're not intimidated. <laughs> when I start writing, I think of all the great writers and I think about this and you just go do it out of ignorance. And he says, you have the power of ignorance. And there's a lot of truth in that because I was raised on a ranch and I was raised with horses and working in the fields and working in the orchards. And I grew up with all these stories and I hadn't read till I was 20. I, w I wasn't intimidated by books and I just, started telling the stories and writing them as simply and as well as I could. Is it like a lack of self-consciousness about exactly. what you were doing? Exactly. And have you been able to keep that as you've written more and more, or does it I, creep I, in? No, 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 I've stayed blessfully ignorant. <laughs> and and it, it really does help, truly, because when I start writing, it's, it's like I have a blank sheet in my head and I just take deep breaths and I start about three in the morning and I go out and I walk around, look at the moon and stuff and the stars and then I go up to my room and it's like, I just start flowing and, and, and I feel blessed and beautiful. What was in the way of seeing the words on the page connect with you? The, 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 I didn't understand that. The, it goes back to my first question. You talked about the benefits right, of not right. being a reader. Until oh, what was in the way, the difficulties? What, was, oh, the, what oh. was the click? How did it happen? Well, the biggest difficulty was a cultural one. Because, see, in English, we're taught to think and to analyze and, and always be in our heads. In Spanish, it's a feeling language. You're always in your heart. So when I first tried to be a writer, I could not believe my parents' stories. I could not believe that you know, that God is, is alive and my grandmother's faith, eternal faith. I couldn't believe that, 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 that uh, the Indians would do these miraculous things and they would walk on fire or they, would, they, 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 would, uh, they could smell where a child had been born and they knew that feelings, that it, without witnessing it, that this was a holy place and that the earth, they talk about the earth in, in terms like this little canyon and they talk about it, that the earth is alive and the rocks and everything. And it wasn't till years later that I began to see, well, cattle do that. That's why 
On the ranch, we would never slaughter a steer near the cattle. We'd take it far away so that they wouldn't smell to death. Because my father said, if you slaughter something near the other cattle, they'll remember that. And it changes the milk and sours this and all that. So it was almost, it was like he had an understanding and a respect for the animals. And then I began to realize that as a culture in English, we'd lost that respect, not only for the animals, but for one another. So uh, the barrier that I had was a cultural barrier. I had been educated in English to think, to analyze, oh, I don't believe that, that's not true, and be a doubting Thomas. So the biggest barrier I had was to get out of my head and get back into the culture that I'd been raised with and, and regain faith in my parents' stories. What was the first book you read? I read, the first one was a, a little picture book called uh, The Family of Man. It was about pictures. And that taught me, without a shadow of a doubt, that we're all one family all over the earth. Black, white, doesn't matter. It shows people at work, courtship. And it was a picture book a that I consider reading. Then uh, the second one, I met this older lady in Mexico City. She introduced me to books at the age of 20. I, I thought she was real old. She was 29. <laughs> and uh, then the second book was Homer. She, I asked you know, if there had ever been a book that had wrote about a whole culture. She said, yeah, a lot of books people have tried to said any of them successful she said well Homer wrote about his culture and all that and I asked her you know is he a local writer and she said no no he's a Greek he wrote a long time ago and, and I said is it still good and she said it's a classic and I said what's a classic she said a classic means it's still good so I read that with her and it started opening up my my life and then the first book I read alone very slowly because I've been dyslexic, was James Joyce, portrait as an artist as a young man. And there was a scene in there about a, a, a little boy wetting his bed and he was 12 years old that was so personal and, and written so well that it had like universal feelings and you could learn from this one scene. Then I began to see, my God, if you write a, a very personal book about what you really, really feel and know, everybody can identify with it. And then writing, the, 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 this little secret jewel can become a jewel for all the world. And, and I guess that, 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 that's what really hooked me on writing. You, you talked a bit about the stories your family told. And in the introduction to Reign of Gold, you said that when you went around, began talking with members of your family, doing research for your family's history, even you couldn't believe it. And, and you said at some point, you began to think they spoke only in metaphors. Yeah, because see, <clears throat> It's truly another world leaving this English speaking. See, English keeps us in like in a prison in our heads. It truly does. We're always analyzing and thinking and, and making judgments on people. And when my parents would tell me stories like the opening of this book starts with a big serpent. My father told me that when he was a little boy, there was a big serpent that would stand up eight feet tall, seven feet tall, and would attack man on horseback, and, he, and the serpent had already eaten a couple of little pigs and a couple of kids in the neighborhood, and everybody lived in terror of the serpent. And then his father's coming up the mountain drunk on horseback one day in Los Altos de Jalisco, and the serpent attacked him, and my grandfather was so, had such a horrible hangover he couldn't run away, so instead he ran and broke a stick off a tree and rammed it into the serpent's mouth. and. Then he ran by with his lariat and roped it and he dragged it into the village and they chopped its head off with axes and the, he said the heavens opened up and the angels sang and a Christian had outdone the devil one more time and the earth was saved and it was a wonderful story as a kid. But then when I started interviewing my father and I was 35 and my wife and I were having our first baby and I want to get a book written so my children won't be ashamed of their heritage. My father tells me the same story, and I said, Papa, that's not true. Th 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 that th those are legends. And he said, well, how about the Chinese and their big serpent of fire and every, they bring out every New Year's Eve? I said, those are legends. Said, that's folklore. And he said, well, then legends and folklore are true. And I said, Papa, I'll be laughed at if I write that. And he said, that's your problem. Get laughed at. <laughs> this was really at the heart of the, the disagreement with oh. the publisher. 
that I mentioned in the introduction. Talk about what happened with Reign of Gold and, and, and what you felt you had to do to get it published the way you wanted it to be published. Well, the publisher, like, didn't believe that story and didn't believe a lot of stories and, and about gold raining down the mountain. So even after I proved it to him, like on that serpent story, I went down to the zoo in San Diego and found out that such a snake exists. It's a Bushmaster. And if they're 12 feet long, it stands up six feet. And they're fearless. So little by little, I found out these facts. And the first volume I wrote was Rain of Gold. And the publisher bought it. And I, I told him it was nonfiction. But she was ridiculed or they read the books and they were trying to sell it for paperback rights. They wanted it to be published yeah, as Putnam fiction. Putnam was showing it around for paperback. And uh, the paperback people weren't bidding big money and she was shocked. And then they told her they couldn't believe the stories and she was going to be laughed at and she bought the wrong minority. And people, Mexicans didn't read and people wouldn't care. And uh, so she was going to call it fiction. That was her way of solving the problem. With a new title. With a new title called Rio Grande. It sounds like an old John Wayne movie. So we had a family meeting and I took money back to New York with me. And I uh, told her that, I, that this was true. These stories are all true. And it needs to be written, pub, uh, published as nonfiction. And we got to put the family pictures in there. And she refused. And when she refused, I, I remember I broke my, my fork and my uh, bent it at the dinner table. And I, and I started crying. And I said that she would not leave that restaurant alive till we settle this matter that this is my child, it's my parents, and she's ridiculing my parents by calling them fiction, and that my life is real and it's meaningful and this is my heritage. And she got very frightened and I was very frightened of how emotional I was getting. Then I started yelling, I want my child back, you've been an unfaithful mother. And then she said, keep your voice down. And then I said, I want a divorce. <laughs> I don't trust you anymore. And then I didn't realize that I was making a big scene in the restaurant and she's a very important woman in publishing. So she got all upset and started crying too and she's an executive. <laughs> and we got very emotional and she sold me back my book and then I was blackballed all over New York as a troublesome writer. Mm. Nobody wanted me. And I searched across the country for two years and ended up with a publish, getting published by the University of Houston out of Texas. And I had to return 75,000 cash to New York, walk out of your house, mortgaged my house, walked out of a $200,000 deal, and went with a publisher in Texas for $1,500. And then, with the, by mortgaging the house, had enough money to go on a tour, get the book published, and we became a bestseller. And all of a sudden, it's like all these great reviews happen and people admired me for standing up for my book and I was embarrassed. I didn't know that I'd done something good and and then all of a sudden we were getting thousands of fan letters and people loved the book and they loved my grandmother and they and the stories they believe are true and they and they start interviewing my mother and we're on the different TV shows and People's Magazine. And, it's the way these things go. And I was God, I was just so happy. <laughs> you now have your second book out, and, and um, I've got a passage from Wild Steps of Heaven that I've asked you to read. And uh, before you read it, can you set the scene? Let us sure, sort of catch up to sure. where you are in the book. Okay. This book, Wild Steps of Heaven, starts, my father was born in 1902 or 1903, we don't know. The Mexican Revolution started in 1910. And uh, my father was the 19th child born to his mother at the age of 50. She was a short, dark Indian woman, and she was married to a very tall, blue-eyed, red-headed Spaniard. And he loved his wife, but was racist and prejudiced. He loved her, but he hated her. He, he, he admired the culture, but he thought himself superior, being Spanish royalty. So there's all this conflict. And that's the conflict of Mexico. That's the conflict of the, the, the European conquest of the whole world. So wherever the family's they come a into, microcosm of yeah, what's going everywhere. on at large. So the revolution has started. 
and there's been rape and plunder and the village has been burnt and, and the kids have migrated to some to California to work on the highways and, 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 and it's now about the year 1912. The war's been going on for two years and my uncle Jose is in, is in prison. He's been arrested. He was a 19-year-old kid with a bunch of little guys on horseback and held off armies. Fantastic and story. All this thing is going on and it looks like the end of the world and the males are either in panic. My father always said that when the going gets tough, men either run off to alcohol or war. It's the women who have the guts to stay home and take care of the children and continue with life. That all power comes from the female. So the first part of the book is about grandfather power, roping a serpent and being show off with horses and showing off in war. And now that everything has been destroyed and run down, the women step in and they take over with survival instincts that have kept us as a species alive for hundreds of thousands of years through the ice age, through floods, through everything. It's the women who are the power of our species. We should mention that, that the scene that you're about to read is being seen through the eyes of your father as a very young boy. My, my father at this time is nine years old and Catholicism is, is the church there. And, and anybody who, who brings up the old Indian ways will be assassinated, will be burnt at the stake. So the women right now are, com are going to combine Christianity with the old Indian spirituality to give them not just security in their head but in their hearts and souls. And my father's witnessing this and he's frightened because he'd never seen the women do it. They'd always done it in secret. From Wild Steps of Heaven. Cold chills snaked up and down little Juan's spine as he watched the fire snapping and burning. He knew that what these old women were doing was very dangerous and strictly forbidden. And if his father, Don Juan, had been home, it would never have been allowed. But Don Juan was gone, and the priest hadn't been there in more than six months either. And so now, here was Juan, along with his mother and sisters, watching these old women chanting freely and bringing forth all the spirits of the heavens and the earth alike. And now the old women began to dance, swaying with their old bodies in strange ways and chanting in soft, eerie sounds. They were talking to the stars. They were asking the approaching Mother Night to bless their beloved friend, Doña Margarita, among all women and give her, f give her the power to bring forth miracles. See, she was preparing to go to the capital and bring back her son who had been taken away in chains. So she needs to go into a reality of living miracles. And they're preparing her spiritually where she becomes a miracle person, a miracle maker. Then Juan couldn't believe it. His own mother suddenly got so excited that she picked up two stones and began to clap them together as she jumped in joining the dancers. And his old mother was swift of foot as a young cat as she moved in and out of the other women, making music by banging the two stones together. And so bang, bang went the stones as Doña Margarita danced. Then Juan's sisters picked up rocks and joined in too, and they were moving their arms like birds in flight, first banging the stones in front of them, then behind themselves. Juan had never seen such a thing, and he'd always thought that his mother and family were totally against these old Indian ways. But he could now see that he'd been wrong, for his mother and sisters were dancing so gracefully that he was sure that they had done this many times before. The sun was gone and the mother moon was out, and the old midwife began to speak, telling the moon in a clip, sing-song voice to always remember that they, the women, came from the night. And so she, the moon, was their special friend. For before the night, for before the light, there was darkness, said Fatima to the heavens, and darkness is female and eternal. Fatima swayed her head from side to side, side to side, tossing her long gray white hair like wings of a bird. Then she raised her arms, floating her hands to each side like rippling water, as if they had no bones. The old woman looked like she was in a trance, and her whole body and her whole face and body seemed to be getting younger and younger as Juan watched them her move with such grace and dignity. 
Then Fatima approached their mother, Doña Margarita, giving her her blessing. And Juan would later swear that he actually felt la tierra, that means the earth, tremble beneath him. Remember, always remember, amiga mia Margarita, said the midwife, as if talking in a dreamlike language, that women like water are forever, and men like fire are only temporary. And so, of course, it was destined to come to this once more. And so we women mustn't panic, but instead open up our eyes and ask the spirits what it is that is being asked of us, las mujeres, this time. For the waters of the universe are infinite, and this is what always happens to men and their little male fires when life gets too difficult, she said laughing. She's referring that the revolution was a fire that the men stirred up with all their principles and rights and wrongs, and now women have to go beyond it. Men, they either go crazy local or just run off to their games of war and empire making. And it's always left to us, the women, as always, to go forth and balance the forces of the earth and the heavens with our great open thighs, she said, spreading her legs apart and leaning back, giving love and more love so that the river of life can go on and on forever. And right after that, they dance around and they jump into a fire and they start stomping out the coals of the fire and putting it out and they don't burn themselves. And interesting enough, now we have fire dances at our <laughs> house right now and uh, my sons have gotten so accomplished in it that uh, they take big hard coals that are, you know, just burn you. In other words, they're 1200 degrees and they'll stomp them out with their feet and they don't mm -hmm. get burnt. In the book, you, the, this passage in particular talks about the, the difference between men and women, and it, it raised to me the question of whether the women in your family reacted differently to these books than the men. Well, yeah, the women liked the book. <laughs> the women liked the book. <laughs> and, 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 and my father likes the book because he was raised by a woman. You know, she was 50 when he was born, so she said to my father, I'm raising you as a woman. I'm not going to make the mistakes that I did with my other kids. But uh, yeah, some of, the men's, uh, some of the men in our family don't particularly like the books. But th there's disagreements. Like my Aunt Charlotte doesn't like the first book. She says, your father was a liar, no good, and <laughs> your mother was lazy. It's, she didn't have allergies. She was just lazy. She says, I'm the real hero. I'm so glad you said that because so often people, everyone loved it and everyone's oh, very happy with it. that's a bunch of bull. You know, and my family has <laughs> fought over the book and... Threatened not to talk to me. My Aunt Charlotte's 91 now, and she still says that she's the hero and that I misrepresented her in the book. These books join an enormous body of American literature that deals with the subject of immigration coming to this country. What do your books share with that tradition, and in what senses are they unique? They sh how they're unique is this, is that the Irish, the Germans, they all came from somewhere, the Chinese. And then they brought the Africans with them, so they were as slaves, so they were, brought them here and they were coming. And the people that were already here were the Indians and, and, and Mexico, the Hispanics, and the mixture of the two. So what's different about these is these people were here before the European influence ever came. So my family had come up to California maybe a hundred years before and gone back to Mexico and they were trading horses and they were trading with New Mexico and Texas, Arizona and California. So they had been going back and forth for hundreds of years. I mean this migration of thinking that people are coming up here recently illegal, they've been coming for hundreds of years back and forth to see their families. So in that way, they're completely different than all the other migrations of people coming. And how they're the same is that my immediate father and his sisters, that only three of them survived the revolution out of 14, and their mother, when they came, they were desperate. They were running from war. They were, they were starving to death. And when they came to this country, my father 
eventually became a businessman, a bootlegger, and then went into real estate. And to him, this was the greatest opportunity in the world, the greatest country. Like uh, he said, when I was very upset here and I returned to Mexico because of all the racist prejudice that happened to me in school that I didn't speak much English and I got slapped around and ridiculed a lot. I wanted to stay in Mexico and my father said, no, you're coming back to the United States. And I said, no, Papa, I'm at peace in Mexico and I don't like that racist country. And he said, that's our country now. We have, you have cousins that died in World War II. You have cousins that died in Korea. Your grandmothers are buried over there. And, and, and I said, but I got all this rage and I just feel like killing. I, I, you said you felt like a bombshell. Yeah, a bombshell. I wanted to, you know, drive, if drive-by shootings would have happened, I would have probably done it if I hadn't found literature as a relief. But my father told me this, and I tell this to gangs and kids. My father said, listen, any damn fool can go around shooting people and killing people and getting revenge like that. What takes guts is to do something worthwhile. And he said, my revenge on this racist, no good country of the United States was to get rich and become a Republican. <laughs> my mother was always a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> but so my father explained to me very simply that this country with all its problems is a wonderful place when you take advantage of it, of the system, and you work within it and you're prepared to, you know, kick ass and get your ass kicked and go forward. Our time is, is nearly up, but I have to ask, there's another book to come. What's left to tell? Well, actually, the f there were going to be three big books, Reign of Gold and three others. But since this book is a lot smaller, there are going to be five now. <laughs> and we're going to bring it up to modern times. And what I'm showing with the overall work is through one family, I'm showing the 20th century and showing that this has been a century of so much change and so many people are frightened. But if we hold on to real faith in our guts, to our families, and know that God is alive and living with us, we can go into the 21st century with all the confidence and understanding that we're good people, all of us. Mm. Well, you have my very best wishes, and I want to thank you for being a guest on Upon Reflection. Victor B. and Senor. Gracias. Wild Steps of Heaven. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.